Hi everybody, welcome back. Um, again, I'm, I'm Austin Bingham uh, from 60 North up in Norway. Um, I want to introduce uh, Chris Klaus, uh, who will be talking about, as you can read, Pythonista, a full-featured Python environment for iOS devices. Um, take it away. Um, hi, fo hi, folks. My name is Chris Klaus. Um, so I'm uh, relatively new to Python. Um, I started computing on a 64-kilobit uh, um, Commodore machine way back in the day. Um, so I've done basic COBOL, RPG, languages you don't even know about anymore. Um, I've also done a lot of Java. I work for Sun, so working on Java. Um, worked for seven years for Apple, um, doing development there. And um, now I work for IBM. And what I do for IBM is I do smarter city software. Um, so I have um, a group of architects who help customers do smarter city software. And um, at the end of the day or on a long flight, um, it's really fun to just break out the iPad and hack on Python. So that's what I'm gonna try and show you a little bit about um, a hobby that I have um, on, on off hours, um, hacking around with Python on iOS devices. Um, so, Pythonista is written here in, in Berlin by a gentleman named Oli Zorn, and I've never met Oli. I hope to meet him later today for the first time. Um, but he writes two products. He writes uh, two iOS apps. The first one's called Pythonista, and that's what today's focus is on. The second one also uses Python, but it's, it's much more for workflows. It's called editorial. And by workflows, I mean I'm a blogger. Um, I go to various conferences and I write blogs and I want to upload my blog. I might want to do some editing of it. I might want to do all sorts of interactions on the text, convert it to PDF, convert it to HTML, convert it to whatever format, and editorial is really slick for that. So um, I personally gravitate towards Pythonista because it's really about writing Python and living in Python, but lots of editorial type folks, um, people who deal a lot with text, documents, love editorial and love its workflow. So I'll focus mostly on Pythonista today. Um, I'll try to show you a little bit of editorial if we have time later. Um, so just, um, just a little bit about what, what we're gonna talk about. Um, what I wanted to do was focus in on, um, on, on this particular issue here, that Apple puts a lot of constraints on um, developers who want to develop applications which are coding platforms for iOS devices. Their principal worry is that you can download scripts that can change the, change the machine. Um, and so there's a lot of constraints around being able to download code into an environment like Pythonista um, and upload code. And so there have been times in the past when Pythonista has been booted out of the App Store by Apple because it, it sort of crossed the lines. And so we play a very delicate game as a community um, trying to make sure that what we do with Pythonista doesn't um, go beyond Apple's guidelines or they actually take the app out of the App Store. Um, so very interesting uh, thing. Um, we have a really strong community with a community forum and I'll show you a little bit of that. Um, the internet here is lousy, so I'm not going to show you it live, but um, I'll show you a little bit of the UI. Um, there's also specific modules that have been put into Pythonista for dealing with iOS things like um, graphics and sound and things like that, but also for dealing with um, third-party things like Dropbox. So I'll talk to you a little bit about that, and I'm really going to try to focus most of it on showing you actual um, apps running. and. Uh, Okay, so that's the main web page for Pythonista. Again, you get the idea. It's a Python environment. It's um, Python 2.7.6 running on iOS devices. And yes, you can run this on your, your iPhone. Yes, you can run this on your um, iPod. So um, yeah, it's a, it's a full environment. Um, and it, it's got a great code editor to it that lets you edit code on the device. But also if you have a Bluetooth keyboard, um, lots of the people in the community use a separate Bluetooth keyboard and that's the way they enter their text. Um, it's got modules for graphics and touch that I'll show you. And um, it's got just recently added uh, NumPy and Mathplatlib, so I'll try and show you those. Um, and it's now got a GUI, a GUI toolkit. So you can build an application with a graphic designer that looks and feels like a real iOS app like to, to an iOS user, you can actually um, put that into um, the, the Apple code tool and then you can upload it to the Apple 
app library. So you can make a full feature running app that looks like a Mac app or an iOS app on your iPad, and you can put it in the Apple App Store. Okay, um, so um, the docs are all online. They're also all in the iPad. So that's a beautiful thing. If you're on a plane and you forget about some standard library function call, or you forget about some module that Oli has provided in the tool, it's always online, so I'll show you that. Um, it's a full feature 276. Um, there's very few things that, that are a little bit special about it, but it, it's really a full feature um, 276. Um, it also includes these special modules that are specific to, uh, to dealing with the iOS, things like um, knowing your location, doing reverse geocoding, which is really beautiful. So um, take, take the, the location of this device and turn it into an address. So I know the street address um, of the, the device at any moment. Um, 2D graphics um, in, in a thing called scene, um, sounds, speech, um, and then this new UI component that lets me create real UI on the iPad that, that looks and feels like any other iPad app. Um, then there's tools like um, Clipboard and Editor that lets me get at, at the clipboard of the, of the iOS device and at the editor of the text that I'm dealing with, so I can actually manipulate the, the text of the editor in, inside. Um, Keychain for, for passwords and things like that. Um, and next up, um, there's some extra modules that are just great things to have, like beautiful soup and requests, and these are just modules that um, are lots of users want, and so Oli includes them. The difficult thing about this platform is it's not really ready for downloading modules like, like you might be used to on your Mac or your, your Windows box, right? So you can't just go out to PyPy and download modules into your device. The community's done a pretty good job of um, letting you download modules that are pure Python, but if modules include C, you're really gotta work hard to get them into, into, the, into this environment. So um, again, he includes lots of good libraries right out of, the, out of the box, which are quite useful. In particular, the Dropbox functionality is really a, a, a lifesaver in, in some instances. Okay, and then last but not least, there's a really active um, community. So um, this is a snapshot of the, of the community this morning. Um, somebody's just uploaded a new game that they wanna show off to people and get them to collaborate. Um, the second one down here, he's tried to rotate text and he's having trouble and he's asking questions of the community. So a really active community, one around Python, one around Pythonista, one around editorial, um, that, are, that are really, uh, really useful. And then last but not least, the, the community has relatively recently created a, uh, a Pythonista tools on GitHub. This is really a collection of um, code that's been specific, specifically built on top of Pythonista. And so um, it lets the, the community point to um, tools and get collaboration around those tools. So um, through, through, uh, through GitHub, we have multiple people editing up tools, games, whatever they might be um, on, on the platform. There's other Pythons on the iOS, and so I thought it would be useful to, uh, to just talk about those. Um, I think by and large, these are things <laughs> that are useful to steer clear of, um, with maybe one or two exceptions. Um, so um, editorial, as I've mentioned, is the sister product, and, and you know, I'd really encourage you to look at it um, in addition to Pythonista. Um, this, this new one is called Computable, and it's just come out. Um, it, is a, um, it is an IPython implementation that has Matplylab and NumPy and all that good stuff. Um, this one is looking good, um, but it's 1.01, right? I mean, it's, it's brand new to the market. So um, comes out of Austria, um, and the, uh, the creator has um, been, a, been a contributor to the, the Pythonista community, and now has come up with this new thing. So it'll be interesting to see the dynamic between Computable and Pythonista. Um, I think those are really the, the two to look at in this space. Um, the other ones um, come from various places around the world. The, one, the ones that I really encourage you to steer clear of are these two. Um, it, uh, they, they, they look interesting, but they're very long in the tooth and they haven't been supported in many years. So um, 
really the, there's other ones out there, but, but these are the ones I recommend. All right, and so last but not least, this is sort of what it looks like. Um, I have um, a list of files on the left. I have the file I'm currently working on on the right. And that's my last slide. So from now on, we're just going to live inside Pythonista. OK. Um, so this, um, this simple file um, just um, uses the speech library. And so what I thought I'd just show you is that there is a thing called speech. Are you talking to me? Are you talking to me? Are you I -O -O? talking to me? And if you know, uh, if you know taxi driver, it make, might make sense. Um, so um, so that's, uh, that's just a simple module that Oli's built into the tool that lets me um, take arbitrary text and pump it through a speech, uh, a text-to-speech engine. Um, it can take multiple languages and is very flexible, but sometimes just useful and fun. Okay, so first and foremost, let's start with um, console. So, so it's got a standard console like you might be used to, um, and so if we go over to the console, um, I can type stuff here. Okay, standard console that you're all used to. Um, but I can, also do, um, I can also do graphics to the console. So let me take a, uh, a simple um, mathematical formula that draws a star, and let me draw to the console. So I can draw either graphics or um, pump text into the console. And again, it's the standard Python console that you're used to. So let me clear that. Okay. Um, um, next up, um, it, there is a, a module that lets me um, that lets me do uh, a bit more sophisticated graphics. Um, it came after the console graphics, and um, it's called Scene. And so Scene is basically um, I get to use the the, the iOS um, visual display. And, and do various things with it. So I'll, I'll show you a few of these. So um, when I create a scene, I can either create it in landscape or portrait, right? Because the, the device can turn. And um, if I do it right, I can create it such that a game or, or anything else could respond to turns, right? So that my game could play either way. Um, so first, I'm going to show you a game called Cloud Jump that was uh, uh, initially put up on the forum. And people said, you know, the, the author said, hack at it. Tell me what you think. Um, so the problem for us is, well, for me is that it's sideways. I'm tilted, right? So I'm gonna I'm gonna play um, if I can. Give me one second. Okay. Um, so now it is tilted. Uh, but I'm gonna I'm gonna play Cloud Jump. She wants to stay connected. <laughs> you guys got that? It's, it's 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 one of those. High, you know, on the iOS devices, you always pick something that's geographically close to each other. Um, they're not exactly secure passwords. There's only <laughs> OK, so Cloud Jump lets me bounce off of clouds. And if it's playing for you, you can see that it lets me. No high score, no sounds, no nothing. OK? Um, so great, great, nice tool that a guy actually built with his young child. Together, they built this as a programming exercise. And he's actually built three or four of these games, um, Jumpy Octopus. And there's a times, times table torture that. So he's, he's created these games with his kids. Um, so he put it up on the community and let the community have at it. Um, what the community did was add high scores, add sounds, add the ability to play in either direction, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if I got a high score, I got to give it my name. And it's a different game. It's got um, monsters. It's got a different character. I can pick my character, et cetera. Um, and so now it's got sounds. And if I die, it's got explosions, all those sorts of fun things. So um, 
again, through, through, the, through the joys of GitHub and open community, people can take something that started as simple, make it better and better, better, and better together. Um, so a lot of what I do um, use it for is things related to my work. So again, my, my work is about smarter cities, and I, I, I work with um, cities all around the globe trying to help them figure out how to use data about their city to deal with problems like water and transportation and public safety and, and things like that. A huge trend in cities is open data, where cities are taking their data and they're publishing it to developers and letting the developers to run wild to build apps. And so a lot of what my work has been about is about showing people the art of the possible. So here what I've done is I've taken four data sets and I have specific formats for them and I um, let people go out and create, um, create extracts of those data sets um, that are then stored locally. So again, I'm gonna go out to a city's open data, I'm gonna grab a couple data sets that I wanna deal with, I'm gonna get on an airplane, and I'm gonna whack at it with numplot and numplot, num, <laughs> numpy and matplotlib, right? So this is a way for me to deal with the disconnectedness of I want open data, and I got the tools, but I'm on an airplane and the airplane doesn't have Wi-Fi. Um, so a simple, simple app that I'd run for you if we actually had good internet here, but we don't, um, to, uh, to, to grab um, data sets and put them into a format that can be used for, um, for uh, Matplotlib. Um, the other thing that, um, that I do around Smarter Cities is we actually sell a tool, and that tool helps people run traffic or water, or public safety or complex stuff. That tool has a REST API. And so what I can do is build into my iPad the ability to talk to some huge system out in the cloud and use that REST API. So here I have um, a, a really nice graphics rich um, platform that I can create a really slick dashboard for the mayor or for the guy who runs the transportation office. And I have a pretty simple, straightforward way to go to a REST API and pull out all sorts of real-time data about traffic as it's going to be an hour in the future or um, where are the leaks in my water system, et cetera. Um, so again, I'd show you those, but the internet here is lousy. Um, let me talk to you one last thing about scene, and that is um, color. Um, so this is called tilting color, and basically the idea is that I'm looking at the pitch, yaw, and roll of the iPad. So I, I have a sensor in the iPad that tells me the pitch, yaw, and roll, and I can change the color, okay? This was just to prove that um, we could build demos and games around pitch, yaw, and roll, um, but it's a simple demonstration of what I can do with a scene. So a very short piece of code just grabs the pitch, yaw, and roll, and lets me play with it and show it off on, on, the, on the scene. Okay, um, one of the people in the community built a game of life. I can run this, so I wanna make sure it's gonna, okay. And then I think I double tap. Give me one second. Okay, your standard game of life. Um, and again, these things um, go up and then they get improved by the community. Um, the contacts module lets me go into the, uh, the address book of, the, um, of the, uh, the iOS device so I can go grab all my contacts and do various manipulations of them. Um, this code just goes out and grabs my contacts and uses the geo coding to, uh, to give me their lat long of, of where they live. So I take the address out of the address book and I use the, the geocoding to turn that into a lat long. Um, so again, really short piece of code, does um, some, some interesting things and can be, can be grown on. Um, recent, tweet, recent tweets um, goes out to Twitter um, and basically for a user tells me what are their recent tweets. So um, I can do these sorts of things um, that, that um, and you guys can write down that my, my key here if you want. Um, um, that, that I, can, I can go out and you know, go to Twitter or um, do, do lots of screen scraping um, sorts of things with, um, with requests and beautiful soup and, and all those basic tools. Um, 
let's talk a little bit about UI. So, um, so this is the the UI tool that that comes with um, that, that comes with the package. Um, it lets me create all the things that you see here. So I can create um, labels and buttons and sliders and switches and calendar pickers and all the rest of the usual stuff that, that people expect out of iOS apps. And basically what it will do is it will create a fi file that's called py name dot pyui. And so that pyui file um, really de um, defines a user interface. And um, I can basically just load in that file at, at, at startup time and I have a, a UI that's ready cooked, ready to, to build with. Or if I want, I can build the UI piece by piece by piece in Python. You, you have your choice. Some people seem to like the, the, the design tool and laying out their UI and really making it nice and then just sucking it all in as one piece. Other people like to build it up piece by piece by piece in Python. Um, so let me just show you um, a little bit of what that looks like in actual uh, reality. Um, so here you can see I can add um, new, new objects. And so I can say that I want to create an object. I want to create sub-views of that object, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, just a really slick, slick little um, addition to, to the tool. Um, whether where you are, um, again, was a simple, simple tool. Um, that uh, uses the geolocation of the current object and then uses an open data um, weather service called Weather Underground, I believe. Um, just trying to see. No, it's called Open Weather Map, openweathermap.org. Um, so again, this tool just gets the geolocation of the device, turns that into a city, state, country, and then goes out to the openweathermaps.org um, and gets the current weather. So it tells me temperature, pressure, humidity, sunrise, sunset, et cetera. Okay, so again, simple tools that get created quite rapidly that, that use um, the sensors in the device, either the, the location sensor, the pitch yaw roll sensor, um, and the various, the touch sensors, the various sensors inside the device. Um, and of course, there's um, the Zen of Python, right? So this is another thing that just writes to the console. And as it's writing to the console, um, the import this text, um, it, uh, it is doing so on um, changing the color slightly. All right, um, just trying to see if I covered what I wanted to cover. Oh, um, matplotlib and, and numpy. So um, here is a a plot out of uh, matplotlib. So if you're used to using these tools and know how to make them go, um, they're all here, fully functional and um, and quite quite useful and powerful. I think it's it's cr it's created a lot of excitement in the community. Having tracked um, Python for iOS for a long time, it was like really a commonly requested thing to get it here, um, and it's just come to market um, in the last four months. So um, it's all in there and people are really starting to, uh, to go crazy with it. Um, it doesn't have, a, the, the, the Python Easton environment doesn't have a search tool um, to search all the files. Um, so I can do that. Um, so I, I've created my own. Um, and basically what it does is it goes, grabs all the files and looks for, it's like a grep. Um, it, it, it brings up something that, uh, that's useful. So um, I can either tap this arrow at the upper right corner of the screen to run, or I can tap and hold. And if I tap and hold, it will let me give command line parameters, right? So you gotta, usually when you're typing at the command line, you'd like to give your Python app script um, other command line parameters so you can run with arguments. Um, and so this, this tool um, will do that and bring the, the text up in, in the editor with the, the text highlighted. Um, I think I've showed you what I wanted to show you. I'm open to questions. Go for it. Doc utils. Um, let me see. Okay. Nope. Nope. Go ahead. Any other sound generation libraries apart from that speech? 
Um, yeah, there's a whole sound um, library, so let me, let me go there. So uh, this is good because it, it lets me show you what, what it looks like to, uh, to be a developer on the environment. Um, so here's a module called sound. Um, it's got samples. And whenever there's samples, I can actually open those samples in the text editor right away and just run them. Okay, so that plays a short melody. Um, and let me go back. Um, so load effect, play an effect, stop an effect, and set volume. Um, there was also some undocumented features inside the sound library that, that parties are using. So um, that's another thing that goes on in the community is people um, sort of <laughs> go through the code and, and find undocumented features that, uh, that are useful, um, but a pretty straightforward, simple sound library. Sound library, I presume, only works on, on iOS. So yes, sir. Something portable. Is there any? Has anybody written something that's kind of a layer above that that has the iOS driver? Maybe then a Windows driver that I can make portable scripts because that seems like a bit of a limitation. Yep. Yeah. So, so not particularly for sound, um, but for other things, I have seen the the community build up sort of a a wrapper around various libraries, but but not for sound that I've seen. There was a question in the back. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. No, I'll, I'll I'll repeat the questions. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, so, so first and foremost, one thing I didn't show you is that I can put certain scripts into a actions menu, right? I, these, these are things that I do often. One of those is Dropbox Sync, and I, I'm just going to try Dropbox Sync. It probably won't work, but maybe the internet's good enough. Um, so, so Dropbox Sync lets me push my scripts into Dropbox. I can then get on my Windows box or thankfully my, my Mac, and, uh, and use, those, use those scripts. So moving things onto and off of your device can be done through this, this community-built tool that is built on top of the Dropbox module. The nice thing about that is I can then Dropbox sync on my iOS device, on my, on my phone, and I, I have code base synced between my two iOS devices. Now, your question was different than that. Your question was, how do I take the app that I've built here on my iPad and how do I get it into the Apple App Store? So, so, so basically, you what, what's the code tool that Apple uses? I can't remember what it's called. Xcode. There we go. Um, basically, you take your Python files and um, you put them into Xcode. And then there's one script, one Python script that you need to run on your Mac to create resources into, into that project. And then you build that project, and it builds down to an iOS executable. And that iOS executable is something that you can put up on the App Store. So again, take the code from here and sync it to your Mac, probably using Dropbox Sync, but there's lots of ways. Um, second, run this script on your Mac, which creates extra resources inside your Xcode project compile your Xcode project, and you have an iOS app that's ready to go into the iOS app store. I don't know the answer whether you can run it in the iOS emulator on the Mac. I'm I, I just not familiar enough with that piece of the puzzle to say. My suspicion is that it does not, but I, I would need to check that. Uh, 
Yeah, so, so that's an awesome point. It's, it's really, really hard to develop on an iOS device on a touch screen. But we've seen people build really complex games on an iPhone. They sit on a bus every day on their ride home from work, and over 10 days, they built a really complex app on their iPhone. So it's a really small screen with really teeny editor and all the line wrapping problems they have. But I gotta tell you that the, the majority of the serious people who really do work on, on Pythonista use an external keyboard. It, it, it's like essential. I actually don't, I, I don't use an external keyboard, but most people do. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I think you're right that, that, that it's hard to, um, to develop um, on the, uh, on the iOS device alone and not be able to emulate on the Mac. Um, and again, I just don't know the answer whether that's doable or not doable. I, I just don't know. Yeah, yeah, all that stuff. So the question was, can you, can you access um, Excel files and JSON and all that stuff? Yeah, the standard JSON libraries in there, um, you know, reading through files is, is really easy. And, and actually, you know, if, if you really love file manipulation, Jeff, definitely check out Editorial too, because Editorial has, has workflow to it um, that, that Pythonista doesn't for, uh, for making that, that easier. Um, there's also lots of conversion capabilities, like uh, I want to convert this whole thing to a PDF, or I want to convert this whole thing back into Excel. Um, so, so there's lots of, lots of good code snippets and, and, and work done by the community um, to do that. So let, let me show you two more things. Um, so um, this is Computable. This, this is not created by Oli. It's, it's sort of a computing product. Um, it is an IPython implementation for the iPad. Um, and so basically, um, you know, the full I, IPython story, um, but, but, you know, re, reformatted to work, work here. Um, and I'm just going to open up a, uh, going to open up a, uh, a book, whatever they call those. Um, and here you can see um, all, all the usual things you'd expect from, a, uh, from an IPython world. Um, he's giving you some samples um, where, uh, you know, he, he shows you how he computed the logo of the app itself. Um, and so, um, so again, there's, uh, there's that tool, which if you're into IPython and, and, and that sort of style, um, I would definitely recommend. And then um, last but not least, let me show you editorial, which might be here. And editorial is created by Oli, so it, it's the sister product to, um, to, uh, to Pythonista. Um, and you'll see it looks a, a bit different. Um, let me just see if I can find one of these. Um, you, you can see that it's got more of the IPython look and feel where I, where I can um, create a, a user interface that, that feels like a web page, um, but it's got more tasks and is more task oriented. Um, and again, based on sort of, let's, let's deal with Markdown first and foremost, but let's deal with lots of other file formats um, in addition. Other comments, questions, and issues? <laughs> um, I, I, I'm a big champion of that. Um, I'm a big believer in that. Uh, so far, um, the, really the only Python 3 um, that I know of is, is really in the other packages um, that I don't really recommend. So I got to say that there isn't a great Python 3 on iOS today. Um, we bug and pester Oli about it, but, but for him it's, it's a biggie, right? So um, a lot of people say they want a single app that's got Python 3 and Python 2. Um, but if you think about that, that's really, really hard from a developer's perspective and from a user's perspective. First, from the developer's perspective, he's got to have two sets of docs, two sets of standard libraries, two sets of worries, and debugging in an environment that does both is really hard. The other, the other way to go is to create two separate apps where he's got, you know, Pythonista 2 and Pythonista 3. And, and you know, the, the thing that he says over and over again is, 
it's a disruptive break for the, for the users. You know, it's, it's gonna create a whole lot more questions on the forum about I, I, this used to work and now it doesn't work and I don't understand the difference between Python 2 and Python 3. There's still a lot of quandary in the community. So um, right now, um, you know, computable is Python 2.7.1. Um, Pythonista and editorial are 2.7.6. Um, we're just not there with a great, with a great Python 3 just yet. Go for it. No, well, so, so I can use Dropbox Sync in two directions, right? So I, I can do that trick. Um, I can mail myself things, right? Pick them up and put them in that way. Um, there's lots of ways in and out. There's um, you know, lots of different methods to get um, text in. Um, I can go screen scrape. I can use requests or U, uh, URL lib to suck in text. There's lots and lots of ways to, uh, to get things. There's also a great set of tools that I didn't talk about that let me go at GitHub, right? So, um, you know, git, git check basically lets me um, check something into GitHub um, and, and retrieve things from GitHub. Um, there's another thing for Dropbox that's much more of a user interface where I pick the file that I want and I just suck in that one file. Um, yeah, there's lots of ways to get things into and out of um, GitHub and Dropbox and, uh, and other techniques. Yeah, so <laughs> this, so the question is about remote requests. Um, this is where we start crossing the lines that get Apple very nervous. So, so right now, Apple doesn't love Python anyway, because Python has got some new momentum that scares them a little bit, and they're really trying to get people to Swift. Right? They're, they're trying to say, okay, we, we told you the answer was objective C, but we were only kidding the answer is now Swift. And people are scratching their head about do they really want Swift or not. Um, so they're really, really trying to use this, um, this idea that mobile code is a dangerous idea, right? And I, I came from, after I worked at Apple, I worked at Sun. So I don't believe that mobile code is a bad idea. I believe that mobile code with the right security and the right sandboxing and the right understanding is, is sort of vital to what, to what we need to do in a modern computing platform. Um, but I can tell you that, that when we um, cross that line of um, doing things automatically, where we automatically bring executable content into the environment and execute it without the user's authority or oversight or, or watching, Apple gets really nervous. And when Apple gets nervous, they actually take the app out of the App Store, right? So um, that, that, that has happened and happen, has happened again very recently. So um, it, it's, it's a line that that is difficult to cross. They, they really don't want mobile code that happens without user authorization and physical clicking. Does that, does that mean that exec and eval and that kind of stuff is disabled? No, exec and eval, that all works. That all works. Go for it. Go ahead. Is there a way to use a version control system in the iOS? <laughs> uh, it depends on whether you call GitHub a version control system. <laughs> um, no, I, I mean, uh, so, 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 so this, is, this is not a replacement for your, your PC or your Windows box or your Linux box. Um, and some of the complex things that you can do and just love on those devices you don't have here. Um, you could probably put something together, but is it there today? No, it's not. But join the community and help us out. One minute. Last question. Yep. Uh, I like to request when I want to say that uh, to make the full picture of the first minute of iPhones on iOS, it is a perfect its name. Kivi. Yep. 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 
Yeah, de de definitely been hearing lately about Kivi and, and people saying it's it's really cool. You can put stuff together really fast with it. Um, pretty interesting platform. So take a look. Um, thanks a lot for your time. It's been a real pleasure to speak with you. Thank you.